Hi, welcome to the introduction to EWS controller. So let's get started. Here's the outline for the session. We will give introduction to what is an AWS controller first. Then we will go on to cover virtual partitions and captive portal on the controller. Last, we will show you how the controller can be deployed based on user locations or user roles. So here comes the first question. What is an EWS controller? EWS controller in a nutshell is a hybrid architecture integrating both access gateway and WLAN controller functionalities in just one box. The controller can be flexibly deployed following one of the three deployment models here. You can either deploy it as a network authentication and access control gateway, which is deployment model one, or you can deploy it as a WLAN controller with AP management, as in the case of deployment model two, or you can combine models one and two and deploy the controller as a combined network gateway and WLAN controller. So how is the EWS controller different from traditional wireless LAN controllers? The EWS controller combines a gateway and a controller in one. So instead of getting a gateway and a controller separately, you can just have one EWS controller to do the job of both. The table here shows the features supported by EWS. You can see on the left that these are the features the EWS controller supports as a gateway. And on the right are features that it supports as a controller. Now, we will move on to explain network partitions on the controller. On the EWS controller, we have service zones, which are logical partitions of the controller's LAN. Service zones can be separately managed and defined by at least one VLAN tag. Normally, you would just have one VLAN tag per service zone. However, with another feature on the controller called PLM, or Port Location Mapping, you can have more than one VLAN tag for each service zone for flexible deployment. We will cover PLM on the next slide. So how do you control network access and usage with these service zones? For each service zone, authentication can be enabled or disabled, and it is enabled by default. The typical scenario is that when users first connect to an SSID, which has been set up to map to a service zone, captive portal of that service zone will show up. And users would have to choose an authentication option available in order to log in to the network. And based on the authentication method selected or the account used to log in, users would be assigned to different groups so that group policies can be applied on the users to restrict and control their network access. So we have just mentioned that port location mapping, or PLM, can be used to create additional VLANs for service zones, so that any service zone can have more than one VLAN tag. This feature is very useful if you have many sites and you want to do location-based advertising, for example. You can assign a VLAN tag to each site so that you can not only do location-based advertising, but also monitor traffic from each site based on the VLAN tags. On our access points, each SSID can carry a VLAN tag. And based on the VLAN tag, the controller would direct traffic to the service zone that has the same VLAN tag. In this example, the SSID staff carries the VLAN of 15, so that traffic from this SSID would be directed to service zone 1 on the controller because service zone 1 also has a VLAN tag of 15. So this is an example showing you how SSIDs can map to service zones on the controller. As you can see on this slide, at least one access point has been deployed at a cafe and a convenience store. It is important to note that multiple SSIDs can map to the same service zone as long as they share the same VLAN tag. So SSID 1 on both access points map to service zone 1 based on the VLAN tag of 15. Furthermore, SSID 3 on both access points map to service zone 5. Note that one SSID has a VLAN tag of 501 and the other one has a VLAN tag of 550. 
but they both map to service zone 5 because this service zone has multiple VLAN tags from 501 to 550. And you may wonder how service zones correspond to LAN ports on the controller. There are two modes you can select for the LAN ports. The first one is port-based mode, and the second one is tag-based mode. In essence, in port-based mode, each LAN port maps to a service zone. And in tag-based mode, all LAN ports are equal, and the controller uses the VLAN tag of the incoming traffic to determine which service zone to direct the traffic to. As can be seen on this slide, when you choose the port-based mode, you can map each LAN port to a service zone. For example, all LAN ports except for ports 6 and 7 map to the default service zone. Then, in tag-based mode, the controller uses the VLAN tag of the incoming traffic to determine which service zone the traffic should be redirected to. If the incoming traffic has no VLAN tag, then it would go to the default service zone. Groups and policies are applicable to users on networks hosted by the controller. First, each group can be granted or denied access to a particular service zone. You can see from the first screenshot on the left that this group can only access certain service zones. Then, each group can have a different policy in different service zones. So in general, a user is assigned to a group based on the account or the authentication method used for login. Then, the controller would check if this group can be granted access to the service zone the user is trying to access. If so, then users will be governed by the policy for the group in that particular service zone after authentication. Now let's take a look at Keptic Portal on the controller. This is one of the most important features supported by the EWS controller. Now we have some understanding of service zones. Each service zone can have its own captive portal. So here you can see that we have three service zones and they each can have their own unique login page. Captive portal can also be customized and you can choose from one of the five options available. The first one is to just use the default login page without any customization. The second one is to customize the page with a simple template. We can change the wording, for example, but the page layout cannot be customized. The third one is upload your own. You can download an HTML sample file that we provide, and you can customize this page and then upload it to the controller. However, only one HTML file can be uploaded along with some pictures. The fourth option is to set up your own external web server so that you can customize the pages any way you want. The last is Editor. What you see is what you get. Editor is available so that you can add, delete, or configure the elements in this page. Currently, this option is only available for the general login page. Here is a list of pages that can be customized, including the general login page, the disclaimer page, the login success and fail pages, and so on. If you're using Payment Gateway, SMS Gateway, or OTP features, related pages can also be customized. In the last section, we will show you two deployment scenarios based on user locations and user roles. It is important to note that the concept of service zones, which we covered earlier, serves as the basis of these scenarios. The first deployment scenario is based on user locations. As you know, different service zones can be used to serve different groups of users, and different groups of users may be located in different locations. For example, from this diagram, you can see that an EWS controller has been deployed at a shopping mall, and Wi-Fi service is available on all three floors in different stores. In this case, we can lease the first service zone to provide network service to customers on the first floor, and the second service zone to provide network service to customers on the second floor, and so on. And this is the deployment scenario based on user locations. 
Then, we can also have another deployment scenario based on user roles. In this example, the EWS controller has been deployed at an office. Network administrators at the office have defined three roles for the users, which are administrator, staff, and guest. And different roles would have different levels of network access. So we can have service zone 1 to service administrators, and service zone 2 to service staff members, and service zone 3 to service guests. And all three roles have their own authentication method as defined in the particular service zone. So administrators will log in using local accounts. Staff members will log in using 802.1x authentication and external RADIUS database. And guests would log in using on-demand accounts. Furthermore, network administrators and staff members can have unlimited bandwidth, whereas guests can only have a bandwidth of 10 Mbps. Moreover, for staff members, they cannot access Facebook during working hours. So this is the deployment scenario based on user roles. That is all for this session. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you in the next session.